Hey guys, new year, new Wi-Fi standard. Damn, don't we live in exciting times. Well, this news has been out for a while, like since last June, I think, but no one has implemented it yet. So as far as I'm concerned, it's brand new. We got WEP all the way back in 1997, my birth year. WPA came along in 2003, with WPA2 coming shortly after in 2004. But since then, it's been, what, like 15 years? We've all been using WPA2. Well, kind of, some people have been stuck in the past, well, whatever. It's time for a new Wi-Fi standard because there's just so many problems with WPA2 that many of which I've discussed here on this channel, what with four-way handshake capturing, deauthing, snooping networks, there's just so much wrong with WPA2, it's time for something new. As I said, this was only announced last year, so devices firmware and router's firmware simply hasn't been made and released, so we're all still using WPA2, for now at least. Whilst we're still waiting for WPA3 enabled routers and devices, I thought I'd take a little look at what WPA3 means for you and I, the type of person that likes to screw around with things, the type of person that thinks it's fun to poke and prod at our networks, to crack our own Wi-Fi password. Why? Because we can. Well, it's not good news, folks. It's actually pretty, pretty bad news. Um, it looks like WPA3 is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a party pooper. A few things that you can do in WPA2 that are pretty big security holes, but are good fun, include Wi-Fi your thing, four-way handshake cracking, uh, tapping networks, all pretty bad security holes, but lots of fun. So let's take these things one by one and see what WPA3 means for them. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. PCBWay is my PCB manufacturer of choice. I've been using them for almost two years now in the manufacturing of PCBs for Molduinos. So when they got in contact to sponsor video, I said, sure, because I already use and recommend their services. If you're interested in designing your own PCB, PCB Way have you covered. They're now offering a $5 coupon on every new order. And if you're interested in assembly, prices start from just $88 for 10 pieces. So PCB Way, it's linked below. So first off, let's take Dior Thing. Dior Thing is an exploit in WPA2 that allows almost anyone to kick almost anyone else off another Wi-Fi network, whether you have access to the Wi-Fi network or not, whether you know the password or not, you can still deauth that person, kicking them off the Wi-Fi network. This is because WPA2 has a security hole in which deauthentication frames, the packets of information that are used to connect and disconnect from a network are unencrypted. So even if you're using a WPA2 network and all the actual data is encrypted, these management frames, the deauthentication frames, are not, so you can simply deauth anyone on a given network. It seems like a silly little thing, why wouldn't the encryption extend to these management frames, but it isn't. So in WPA3, deauthing will not be possible, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on how you look at things. So in this case, you should get your deauthers whilst they're hot at maltronics.com, a site which um, I run and own, you can get deauthors. These are dedicated little boards that you can use to deauthenticate other devices off a network. Again, only use it on your own networks for fun, but um, it's pretty cool. They're like little boards and you can control them via a little OLED display or connect them wirelessly via your phone. And I'll link those below, but I thought that was a pretty good segue into an ad, so I thought I'd take it. It should be said, however, that deauthing itself was fixed back in 2009 when 802.11w was released. However, no manufacturer bothered to implement 802.11w, so whilst your thing was technically fixed, it wasn't in reality because no one used it. So whether they'll bother to implement this new security fix remains to be seen. Currently with WPA2, you can record and capture the four-way handshake. Now the four-way handshake is just a complicated way of saying the data that's exchanged when two devices connect to each other. So you can record that data that's exchanged and then take that and crack it with a GPU offline. And then you'll end up with, if you're lucky, the passwords used to connect to the router so you can connect to the router yourself and do whatever. In a previous video, I showed you how to do just this capturing that four-way handshake, and given that many ISPs, the passwords they give on their routers are very predictable, it is often quite easy to crack um, that password in just a few days with pretty reliable results. Well, WPA3 uses a new handshake protocol, which isn't vulnerable to brute force attacks. They call it the Dragonfly Key Exchange System, because 
Actually, I, I don't know why they call it that, but it sounds cool. This new security standard requires network interaction to attempt to log in between two devices using WPA3. So offline GPU cracking is officially dead. So no more handshake capturing and cracking on your GPU. It's a, it's a sad moment to be fair. So to do a dictionary attack, you would actually need to enter a bunch of random passwords when you're physically connecting to the network, kind of like trying to guess someone's Gmail password by just entering a load of random stuff and Google is going to lock you out after three attempts, whatever. And a router will probably lock you out after a few attempts. So yeah, sad day indeed, sad day indeed. But how about tapping Wi-Fi networks? And by that I mean gathering the data of other people on the network. Because of course, if it's WPA2 and you're connected to the network, you can see the traffic of everyone else on the network. I mean, if they're using HTTPS, then obviously you can't snoop that, but everything else is game. And if it's an open wireless network, then hell, you can snoop that whether you're connected or not. It doesn't really matter now, does it? Well, when it comes to WPA3, your data will automatically be encrypted without the need for a password. So that means even if there's no password on the network itself and you're in a random coffee shop, if they are using WPA3 on an open network, when you connect to that network, your data will be encrypted. Presumably the device and the router will negotiate some kind of session key and use that to communicate. So any bad actor in that coffee shop won't be able to snoop whatever you're doing, which is a great step forward in security to be fair. It does this using opportunistic wireless encryption, whereby the client and the device come up with their own secret key instead of relying on the shared public key. Also on that point, with WPA2, you can still passively intercept packets if you don't know the password. And then when you manage to figure out the password, you could decrypt all those packets that you've managed to capture in the past. Well, with WPA3, that will again not be possible because WPA3 is designed with forward secrecy. This means that past sessions are protected against future compromises of keys because a unique key is generated for each session. So you just can't go back in time and decrypt all those sessions you've already captured. So for the most part, that's the gist of what WPA3 fixes. But what can you do with WPA3? What is left out? What haven't they bothered to fix? Or what is still a problem with Wi-Fi that they simply cannot fix? Well, ARP spoofing is still a thing. ARP spoofing is when you BS to other clients about your IP MAC address combination. Um, ARP messages can be sent by anyone across the network and they are unauthenticated. So it allows anyone to update another host's ARP table, pretty much. SSL stripping and DNS spoofing haven't changed, so there is that. But again, these things here, for example, SSL stripping is something that isn't really Wi-Fi's problem. That's something higher up the food chain that needs to be fixed. But on the face of it, it looks like WPA3 has done a pretty good job of fixing up WPA2's shortcomings, deauthing, four-way handshake capturing and cracking, as well as passively tapping networks have all pretty much been fixed. Well, of course, unless someone figures out a way to bypass these uh, as they did with crack. But there is a pretty big asterisk to all of this because WPA3 only mandates the implementation of the Dragonfly handshake, as well as protected management frames in order for a device to be certified. This means in practice, all a manufacturer has to do is implement the new four-way handshake protocol, as well as protected management frames, and then just slap a certification label on it and they're done. They could ignore the passively tapping networks part of everything altogether if they wanted to. But in that case, since protected management frames are covered by being required, it looks like in terms of Dior thing, we might be out of luck. However, this one guy, Matty Van, yes, that guy, this one boffin with a PhD thinks protected management frames are a fad and that people, people will find new ways to bypass protected management frames and still forcibly disconnect clients for a network. And he even put it in bold, so we still got, we still got some hope. Why he thinks that, he doesn't really go into it, but uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we could just have to wait and see. So it's all well and good having a new Wi-Fi standard, but the question is, when will it be here? So the adoption of new security standards in Wi-Fi is historically pretty slow. I'm on wiggle.net here, and if you scroll down, it will give you a bunch of statistics over time. So I think this goes back to the early 2000s. So I've zoomed in here, my cursor seems to be kind of offset, but uh, you get the idea. So in 2003, 4 WPA2 was introduced. However, it took 
like 10 years for it to be up to about 40% market share, which is um, very slow, <laughs> really slow. And let's not forget, during this whole period, we're still kind of in the adoption phase of Wi-Fi period. So I, I can't remember when we got a Wi-Fi um, router at home, but oh, it wasn't till, I don't know, 2010 maybe? 2009, it's like, I can't remember. But given that everybody already has wireless routers, it's hard to see people themselves making the upgrade since the education is very lacking in security, especially Wi-Fi security. Most people just simply don't know what WPA2, 3 WPA is. So it is possible that manufacturers might develop firmware for currently existing hardware and then release it so as to bring current devices up to the WPA3 standard. But let's not forget WPA3 is a hardware certification. So whilst it is possible that manufacturers might, might put out firmware to bring old tech up to standard, it's unlikely and it's much more possible that manufacturers will simply just focus on bringing the standards to new devices because it's not like the public are clamoring for WPA3, <laughs> like nobody knows what this stuff is. It will take a while for WPA3 to become standard. You can already find a few WPA3 enabled routers on the market, but, um, well, uh, you can according to some articles I've read, but I can't seem to find any on Amazon or anything, so uh, you take their word for it. But yeah, it's gonna take a while, so get your authors while they're hot, <laughs> Maltronics.com. So thanks for watching, guys. This was a very word-heavy video. There wasn't much interesting going on on screen, but um, I hope some people found it um, useful and interesting, and I couldn't really find anything else like this out there. I'll put all the sources for uh, my research down in the description, so check that out if you want. And yeah, I am looking forward to the new year. Happy, happy new year, everyone. I haven't said that yet, but if there's anything you want to see from me in the new year, let me know down below. I've had a bit of a slow start to this new year. I've been dealing with a bunch of other stuff recently, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and thanks for watching. Have a good one.